most of the farmers, after harvesting, they will come and burn all the farm. When we're burning the bush, we are killing the soil. We have some, some small, small animals there. That one bring the soil capacity. Everything goes on the life. Ready? Go. Instead of fluffing the whole soil like this, you make lines. So it goes with the rhythm. We need to have more trees back here. Oh, <laughs> you know, look at the way this mess are just doing. This is the point at which I cannot dig any longer. This hard soil layer has developed as a result of local climate conditions and land preparation methods. Slash and burn is a common practice here. At the end of the dry season, farmers set fire to clear the land in preparation for the next farming season. Without weeds, bushes, and trees, the bare soils left behind cannot supply organic matter. There are no leaves or plant stalks to decompose and provide fresh nutrients. After the land is cleared, farmers mostly plow or build mounds or ridges. These practices make the soil lose its capacity to hold nutrients and water. Without plants, there are no roots to hold the soil and no canopies to provide shade. The soil is left without any protection against the extreme weather conditions here. Hot sun dries up the soil and kills many of the organisms living inside. Powerful tropical rain gives the final blow. The land erodes and what is left of organic matter and nutrients is washed away. If we get to where the place is hot, the shovel can no more go down. So if we grow our crops, the roots cannot go down. What the men in Dogo are experiencing is called a hard pan. The hard pan has developed over many years of intensive plowing. Plowshares and this fluff up and loosen the soil on top, whilst at the same time, compress it below to form this hard layer. The hard pan is so compressed that plant roots can't get through to the nutrients down below. Rainwater does not sink in, but runs off along the hard pan. The soil top layer further erodes and plant nutrients are washed away. If the cycle continues for long enough, the soil loses fertility and turns into desert land. Dogo is not an isolated case. Conventional and traditional agriculture across Africa is in trouble. The zone immediately south of the Sahara Desert is especially affected. Land available for cultivation shrinks, whilst population grows at a fast rate. To stop the trend and maintain soils fertile, another approach to agriculture is urgently needed. Don't look onto your crop. Look into the soil. Let the soil provide what it is for the crops to grow. Patrick works for the Center for No-Till Agriculture, an organization promoting a shift away from conventional farming practices. We work through the principles of conservation agriculture which are little disturbances to the soil, uh, maintaining cover, permanent cover crops, and then crop diversity. And these are the three key principles that we work around. Conservation agriculture involves a complex set of practices, which are all guided by three principles. One, 
minimize soil disturbance, two, keep the soil covered, and three, practice crop diversity. The first principle is little soil disturbances. We try as much as possible not to plow, not to bend the residues after clearing, and not to use hoe in weeding so deep into the soil. We try to simulate what happens on the field based upon the way you prepare your land. This container is assumed that it's a plow land. We always tend the soil as it's done on the field of plowing. This at the middle one is serve as conservation plot. We don't work the soil. We put mulch on the soil surface and then my extreme right one, we put trash on it and set fire and burn the trash. So this is what we call slash and burn plot. This thing has been here for two years now. All the soil here have gone. As it rains, the soil loss is heavy. We fill it to the brim, but as it rains, just like if I want to demonstrate, quickly the water turns red. As it's moved, it moves with particles, soil particles. On the conservation agriculture plot, you put it in there and sometimes you don't even see the water coming. You are retaining the soil even as it rains. Slash and burn equally, the soil cannot contain the water. Why? There's no much nutrient. There's no life in the soil. Slash and burn as well as plowing strongly reduce the soil's water holding capacity. A field covered with weeds and an undisturbed soil structure keeps moisture in and withstands the forces of erosion much better. Neither burning nor plowing is good for the soil, but what about building mounds or ridges? Here we are, we have yam farms and we never made any mound. It is planted directly onto the bare soil and this is a tuber that is growing even bigger than where they have planted on a mound. This is moundless. We dig and plant yams directly. And I'm even using my hand to bring the soil. So it means that the soil is not hard underground. Farming yam without mounds is quite possible and feasible. Building mounds and ridges has a similar degrading effect as plowing. But with healthy soil, there is no need to do that. Since my childhood, I've been seeing farmers growing tomatoes, lettuce, cabbage, carrots, only on ridges and mounds. So when I see practice of conservation agriculture, directly putting those things without those things, I'm happy. By applying the principles of conservation agriculture, Patrick and his colleagues have created a small garden of Eden. Soil full of life, enabling the growth of beautiful crops without application of much chemical fertilizers. In the first year, we may apply fertilizer. The second year, we may even not apply fertilizer because we had already put in so much organic matter in the soil. Even if you need fertilizer, it cuts down the amount. If you are applying five bars of NPK fertilizer on conventional plot, you might be applying just two bags. In a place like Dogo, the starting conditions for a shift to conservation agriculture are not the best. The first thing that needs to be done is to break the hard punt. Manually, it is extremely hard work. A motorized ripper saves a lot of sweat. If someone has a field where he has been plowing for a long period of time and as a result of that is experiencing this hard punt, then there will be the need to come in with the reaper just to break that crust or hard pan underneath the soil. Fidel uses the reaper to prepare this field for conservation agriculture. The tines are long enough to cut through the hard pan located underneath the soil top layer. Fidel will later plant the seeds of his crops directly in the lines. The ripper has cut into the hard pan. 
By planting into these rip lines, he ensures that his crops can reach soil nutrients below the hard pan. This is how deep the ripping has gone. Very, 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 very deep. So should there be any dry spell here, hey, we are safe because we know our plant has no restrictions so far as root development is concerned. In a conservation agriculture workshop, Fidel discusses the difference between ripping and plowing with local farmers. What are the effects of plowing? It is true for how you want your fields to look like. But hey, I am here to tell you that if you are turning your soil every year, you are turning your soil every year, then you are doing more harm than good. Under normal circumstances, when you are plowing, you make the place very fluffy. Mm -hmm. Plow for me, that is my plow man. <laughs> and then the ripping, instead of fluffing the whole soil like this or the whole field like that, what we do is you make lines. Which of these will experience a lot of soil wash when there is rain? experience a lot of erosion in the uh, plot P mm -hmm. because the soil is loose. Mm -hmm. If it rains and water comes, it will take the soil away. Okay. And if you look at plot R, it's only lines that you've created where you will sow your seed. And when it rains too much self, but it can wash the soil away. So that one is preferable okay. than the plot P. Let's recap some of the information on the first principle, minimize soil disturbance. What is the disadvantage of turning the soil or plowing? You have a few seconds to think for yourself before we will give you the answer. Without proper structure, rain can easily erode the soil. What is the name of this tough soil layer, which is often created by intensive plowing? It is called a hard pan. It restricts plant root development and leads to erosion of the soil top layer. Once it has established, you need to break it to revive soil fertility. 3. What kind of motorized tool can be used for this job? The answer is Ripper. The tines of the Ripper break up the hard pan. All that the plant needs from the soil must stay in the soil for the plants to absorb them. If you don't cover, you tend to lose so much water in the soil through evaporation. Healthy soil contains moisture, as well as microorganisms, very small animals that contribute nutrients to your soil. Without a cover, the soil heats up. Moisture evaporates, many of the microorganisms die, and the soil loses fertility. The impact of rain on unprotected soil causes further damage and erosion. A cover stops sun rays from entering. Moderates temperature for the soil organisms. Keeps the moisture in and protects the soil surface from heavy rain. There are two strategies to create soil cover. Cover crops and residue cover. Residue cover is created simply with leftovers, any type of organic matter you don't eat or sell. Groundnut shells, for example, can be used to protect and nurture freshly planted maize.
After harvest, there is another effective way to create a residue cover. The farmers simply trample down the maize stalks. Working on a larger scale, the same exercise can also be done with a roller crimper. When maize stalks are standing, it doesn't cast enough sheet to cover the soil. And so when you crimp and you bring it down, we are going to get enough sheet to ensure a good soil cover. The problem with residue cover is that you can hardly rely on it to last till the next growing season. The residues decompose. For the sake of your soil, it's better to restrict the movements of your animals, otherwise they will eat up your soil cover. We have two types of cover. Residue cover, and then we have cover crop, which also is a live crop that is also used as a cover. Cover crops are plants you establish with a specific aim to improve soil fertility. You plant them either directly in between your main crop or separately. Planting the cover crop within your main crop is called intercropping. It is done to allow the main crop and cover crop to interact and support each other. Another way is called strip planting. You grow the cover crop in separate strips within the plot of your main crop. By moving the strips season after season, you allow them to do their work bit by bit on the entire plot. It is not good for your soil to always have the same crop growing again and again at the same spot. The strips give it a chance to recover. Soil nutrients are used more efficiently because main crop and cover crop have different preferences. A fallow is another way to rotate your crops. Its main advantage is to eliminate pests and diseases, specialize in attacking a particular crop. If you take away your maize for one season and plant another crop in its place, you take away the food for all the pests and diseases specialized in maize. They starve and in the subsequent season you can bring back your maize, which will enjoy pest-free and fertile soil. If your land is so much exhausted, you can bring back life into the soil by planting fast-growing cover crop. If I lift this one up, you can see that there are so much Biological activity is going down there. There's so much leaves that are shedding. This is going to increase nutrient into the soil. I can even dig with my hand and you could see the crumbs and look at the organisms. Everything goes on the life. If you plant the same crop on the same piece of land for several years, it's exploiting the same nutrient within the same zone. It's better sometimes to change different crops. You bring diversity into the soil system and even is able to control pests. For example, the pest that attacks maize, if you plant copy in the subsequent year, the likelihood for that same pest to attack the copy is not there. We always want to diversify by trying to rotate the crops that we grow on that same piece of land year after year, season after season, to make the land very, very suitable and healthy. Let's have a look at some of the popular cover crops. This one here is cowpea, which is a good combination for maize as the main crop. Maize belongs to the family of cereals, just like rice, wheat, millet, and sorghum. Cowpea is part of the legume family which includes all types of beans, peas, or lentils. These two plant families, cereals and legumes, mutually support each other in growth and therefore are always a good match. Legumes such as cowpea have a unique ability to fix nitrogen and make it available for cereal plants. Nitrogen is an important plant nutrient essential for the growth of all plants. Without enough nitrogen in the soil, maize and most other plants will grow very slow. Legume plants such as cowpea have an interesting strategy to fix this problem. 
In a fascinating deal, legume plants receive nitrogen from a soil bacteria. First, the legume builds a house for the bacteria. The bacteria moves in and starts to take nitrogen from the air inside the soil, converts it to a form that is usable for the legume and feeds it to its host. The legume reimburses the guest with carbohydrates, food for the bacteria. The cowpea shares the nitrogen it received from the bacteria with a neighboring cereal plant through the roots and falling leaves. This complex exchange between soil bacteria, legume and cereal saves farmers a lot of money. Instead of buying chemical fertilizer, you can allow these three to live together and create their own nitrogen. On roots of legume plants, you find these nodules, which are the little houses the legume created for the bacteria. If you open the nodule, you can even check whether the bacteria are doing their job. This one is reddish, meaning that the bacteria are actively fixing nitrogen. If the nodule is white inside, the deal doesn't work out and you should try to plant another legume. Another popular legume is Cannavalia. Apart from fixing nitrogen, its root system brings further benefits for the soil. Cannavalia builds a strong tap root and a system of fibrous roots. It loosens the ground whilst at the same time holding the soil together. Oxygen, which is also important for the soil fertility, is allowed in without breaking up the soil structure. Secondly, the roots work as a form of weed control. Once Cannavalia is established, it is extremely difficult for unwanted weeds to take hold anywhere close. Thirdly, the deep tap root is a sort of nutrient pump. It reaches into the soil layers far below the range of maize and pumps nutrients up into the plant. When the plant is slashed, the nutrients return into the soil top layer, where the maize can take them up. This is Cotillaria spectabilis, very beautiful like this. It's a plant that attracts a lot of pollinators. And if you look at the yellow color of it, even from Togo, they will still be attracted to it. This is Cotillaria jonesia. Actually, they are brothers and sisters. Um, flowers are the same, but then the leaves, this one looks thinner. Cotillaria jonesia builds a root system similar to the one of Cannavalia. Let's look at this. Jonesia always comes with what? The combination of what? Fibrous roots and then tap roots. Let me shake it. Now, because um, because the fibrous roots are so much, the soil was able to even hold up, even it was still intact when I, I lifted it. One may ask, what does the tap root do? This tap root can go as deep as possible. And so nutrient that has even gone beyond the reach of maize, the tap root can go deeper, bring them out into the leaves. The leaves will then fall onto the surface and then it will decompose. And so your maize will get the benefit of that particular nutrient that had gone what very far. Both types of crotolaria provide valuable protection against a tough pest. Nematodes, also called eelworms, are a great threat for vegetable crops, in particular for tomatoes, but they also attack maize. In tropical Africa, they have become a widespread problem. Crotolaria provides a soil around with its own natural chemical suppressing the pest. The chemical creates protected zones where nematodes cannot survive. Supplied with enough organic matter from your crotillaria or any other cover crop, your soil can even go for a counter-attack. Enough biomass in the soil attracts predator fungi. The fungi literally lay out traps for the eelworm 
in form of small loops. Once the nematode enters the trap, the fungi tighten the loop and swallows the pest, turning it into additional nutrients for your soil. This is Krimukuna. It is the best cover crop when it comes to weed control. And so here, if you can see, the weeds here are not even visible. The vines are what? Bringing everything what? Down. You don't plant Krimukuna in maize when uh, the maize is maybe one week old. If you do that, have you seen the, the vines or the ropes? They will bring everything down. Now, look at this very well. Look at the leaves, look at the vines. And now let's look at what is happening behind us. There's a different type of mukuna here, bush mukuna. Now, if you are planting this bush mukuna in your maize, even the same day, if you plant your maize the same day and you plant this the same day, because it does not climb, it does not have the vines, you are safe. Now, all these things I have discussed, if you want the benefit of each of them, then it even get better when you mix everything together here. The idea of permanent soil cover with a variety of cover crops is very different from what farmers in this workshop have practiced all along. Instead of planting into bare and loose soil, they are supposed to plant into a soil covered with crops and plant residue. How is this even done? Most of the time, farmers will always make a clean field, they burn all the trash, sometimes make belts or ridge before they transplant. But here in our case, in the conservation agriculture, we plant directly onto the soil. We want to get the plant into the soil. And so the surroundings will have all the debris around. All these ones are the ones that we need to cover the soil so that we can get much, much more organic matter incorporated into the soil. Seeds are also planted through the soil cover. Work tools like this jar planter make the exercise easier. So we put organic fertilizer onto one of the chamber and then we also fill the other chamber with seeds. And this one is maize seeds. At every point in time that we are jabbing, the bottom is closed. In the soil, you open, bring it up, So it goes with the rhythm. If you're a very good planter, you must not forget about rhythm. This is the motorized version. It is called a direct planter. Ready, go. As the spike wheel cuts through the soil cover, Seeds fall into the plant line. We want to leave the trash as much as possible on the ground. Let it serve as a cover and then gradually decompose to give the nutrients and also conserve moisture for you. Exactly. Time to recap some of the information about principle two and three. Keep the soil covered and practice crop diversity. First question, what are the two different ways to create soil cover? You can use A, residue cover, and B, cover crops. Second question, which one of these is a legume and which one a cereal? Maize is a cereal and cowpea is a legume. What is the advantage of planting legume and cereal together? The legume fixes nitrogen for the cereal and thereby improves growth without the need to buy chemical fertilizer.
Next question. What can you learn from looking at the nodules on the roots of legume plants? If the inside of the nodule is reddish, the bacteria living in it are actively fixing nitrogen. If it is white, they haven't moved in or they are not doing their job. Next question. What are the benefits of following a crop rotation? Crop rotation helps to use soil nutrients more efficiently and to break the life cycle of pests and diseases. Next question. Try to remember the names of each of these cover crops. A. Cowpea B. Crotolaria spectabilis C. Carnavalia Which one of these helps to control nematodes? B. Crotolaria spectabilis provides good protection against the aggressive eelworms. We are very close to the desert. For agriculture to survive, we need to have more trees back here. James Amaligo is a forester who dedicated his life to the reforestation of the savanna. A tree is the doctor of the soil because it's only the tree that can bring life back to a dying soil. Trees play a similar role for the soil as cover crops, just much bigger and stronger. Fallen branches and leaves provide organic matter. Certain tree species can also fix nitrogen, some even much better than any cover crop. In the struggle against extreme weather conditions, trees have great abilities. The canopy shields against scorching sun, helping to keep moisture in the soil as well as to moderate temperature. Destruction caused by heavy rainfall is diminished in two ways. The canopy reduces the impact of the raindrops, whilst the strong roots keep the soil together and avoid erosion. Gregory Kelle is a farmer who was never trained in conservation agriculture, but from his own observation in many years of farming, he realized the importance of trees. I want to have many trees because I want the place to be wet and then to be fertile. Since there weren't many trees left on his farm, he started replanting. To boost their growth, he prunes the trees by cutting off lateral branches. The cut-off branches serve as a residue cover, which he later mixes into the soil to provide it with organic matter and improve soil fertility. In the conservation agriculture, we advise farmers not to cut all the trees from their field. We want them as much as possible to play around planting some trees as well as crops. When you want to leave trees on your farm or plant new ones, the question is which ones to leave or where to place them without giving up too much of the space you need to grow crops. One very common way is to create a tree shelter belt around your farm to protect your field from wind and also to stop animals from entering. Another way is called alley cropping which is done to allow your crops to benefit from specific features of the trees you plant. In the alley cropping, we plant in between the two alleys. And this on my left is Lucina plants. The Lucina tree is among the very best nitrogen fixers of all plants. Crops growing in reach of the alley of Lucina trees benefit from cost-free nitrogen supply. We cut the biomass and then mulch the field on my left. On the other hand, we have another alley, and this one is called Glyricidia. Glyricidia is another powerful nitrogen fixer. The Glyricidia is also a leguminous plant, and we also cut that one and mulch the other field, and so that we see the difference of the two. We want to compare and see which of them gives so much 
uh, nutrient to the crop that we grow. The uncountable different tree species all with their own benefits. Some provide fruits, some are good for construction, some provide medicine, and others are very good in fixing nitrogen. Try to find out which of these trees around that really benefits me more by through its work on my farm. When you find out about those trees, even if you don't have them growing already on your farm, go and look for some and come and plant there. Osman Zakaria is a lead farmer in his community. He prepares a plot to demonstrate the advantages of conservation agriculture to his fellow farmers. He wants his neighbors to stop the slash and burn practice once and for all. Most of the farmers, after harvesting, they will come and burn all the farm. That's no good. If you burn the farm, number one, you are kill the nutrients in the soil. And then you are kill, we have some, some small, small animals there. That one bring the, the soil capacity. Osman is convinced once farmers in his community see the benefits of conservation agriculture with their own eyes, they will never want to go back to the conventional practice. I want to promise you by December, when you come back in my field, you will surprise. You will surprise. I'm telling you. We take him by his word and will follow him throughout the season to check the progress he makes. The soil is very good, no hard pan and no need for ripping. It's May, rainy season has started. Time for Osman to plant the seeds of his main crop, maize. Two months later, in July, we return to his farm. The maize has germinated. Since there were no cover crops on his field during the last season, the ground is bare and Osman needs to apply chemical fertilizer. It will make you hole like this, you poke like this, so that you cover. The plant will, will observe all. By inserting the fertilizer into the ground, you ensure that nutrients reach your plant instead of being blown or washed away. But Osman hopes that with the introduction of cover crops, he won't even need much chemical fertilizer in coming seasons. September, two months later, maize and cover crops have flourished. This cover crop is cowpea. Intercropped cowpea will provide the young maize with nutrients for its growth. When the peas are harvested, they bring in additional income. But for the purpose of covering the soil, the crop is only a temporary solution. After they harvest the cowpea, I'll try to come to apply mokuna here. Osman wants to intercrop his maize with cream mokuna. Here, he planted the invasive crop on a separate field, but waited with planting it into his maize. So if you want to use cream mokuna as your cover crop, don't plant it early. Intercropped at an early stage, the vines of the cream mokuna could damage the maize. But once the maize is strong enough, the cream mokuna can be introduced in between the plant lines of the maize and will provide efficient and lasting soil cover. When I was harvest the maize, the mokuna can cover the soil, waiting for the next season. Osman also planted the other type of mokuna, called bush mokuna. Being less aggressive and non-climbing, bush mokuna can be intercropped with maize earlier than cream mokuna. If you look at this plot, I didn't wait. Here, Osman planted cannavalia. The cover crop is non-climbing and he intercropped it directly with the maize. The reason why I like this cannavalia, kind of it can cover the soil and break the wheat. Because of the cover, uh, wheat cannot come out. The cover crops have started to do their work on the soil and Osman notices a positive effect on his maize. Oh, <laughs> you know, Look at the way this mess are just doing. So I'm very happy. October, one month later, 
the dry season is just about to start. Uh, welcome back to my farm. The maize are mature. The cream kuna intercropped into the maize on top of the residue of the cowpea has flourished just within one month. It already starts to sling its vines around the maize stalks. The cream kuna on the separate field has developed into a thick bush. If you look at the mukuna, it's covered all the soil. So this is the mukuna. This is what they were doing. So if you look at the structure, but it's good. Black, which means when you plant means here next year, you, so you shouldn't worry to bring any more fertilizer here. But already the mukuna leaves are already de uh, decomposed put fertilizer through the soil. The intercrop carnavalia has also grown tall. While the maize stalks are exhausted and brown, the cover crop is still green and vital, a feature that will prove to be beneficial later in the season. December, two months later, dry season is in full swing. Osman just harvested the maize and now the advantage of the intercrop Krimukuna is clearly visible. Its vines are slung around the maize stalks. Trampled down, you have a combination of residue cover and living cover crop. This thick layer will keep the soil alive and healthy throughout the dry season. Dry season time, sun will be too hot in this area. That is why we are trying to plant maize, put Mokuna inside, after harvesting, you break the stock down to cover the soil, bring nutrients in your soil. February, two months later, middle of the dry season, a bushfire attacked the farm. If you look at here, Everything is complete burning. It's only the, the, this small, small trees that are stand. Osman is disappointed by the ignorance of his neighbors. In spite of the knowledge he shares with them about life in the soil and cover crops, bushfires are still the norm here. The bushfire burn are not helping the soil. A group of hunters passes by, just as we speak to Osman. When you reach your farm, you are not here. They can put fire there. A rabbit can come outside so that when they will see it, they can kill them. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. mm. they, they still was in farmers and they are still doing that. In the hunt for a rabbit, these men and boys who are farmers themselves can burn down acres of farmland. When we're burning the bush, which means we are killing the soil. When we kill the soil, why are we able to get uh, food to feed ourselves? Against all odds, the major part of Osman's demonstration plot survived the bushfire. His cover crops impressively proved their ability to protect. The Carnavalia stopped the flames before they were able to reach further into his field. That is why the, this plot is not being quickly that they were still in green. You know, the, the green Carnavalia cannot burn. Thanks to the Carnavalia firewall, most of the demonstration plot was saved and Osman soil has a protection that can last throughout the rest of the dry season. On the separate cream mukuna field, the soil cover is especially dense. Let's recap the information we learned from Osman's example. What are the names of these cover crops? A. Krimukuna B. Kaupi C. Carnavalia 
which one did Osman not intercrop until his maize was a few weeks old and why did he do so? The answer is cream okuna. Its vines are so strong that if intercropped too early, they could strangle the young maize plants. But if intercropped later, there is a benefit to the invasive nature of the plant. Do you recall? The cream okuna entwines with the maize stalks. After harvest, this combination provides a powerful soil cover. Which two principles of conservation agriculture does Osman put into practice here? Osman follows principle 2, keep the soil covered, and also principle 3, practice crop diversity. He uses the advantage of different crops together to improve his soil. Which cover crop saved Osman's fields from being destroyed by bushfire? Whilst most of his crops were dry and would have easily caught fire, the Carnavalia was still green and stopped the bushfire from spreading further. There is no question about it. Conservation agriculture means a great shift away from old habits. Burning is an absolute taboo. Instead of loosening the soil or plowing, you should create rip lines and plant directly into a soil full of residue and cover crops. Instead of focusing on just one crop, you should embrace a wide range of crops and even maintain trees on your farm. It means a great change, but it is within the reach of every farmer and the truth is, the way conventional agriculture was done for so many years is not sustainable any longer. Soil loss is a real problem. More and more arable land turns into desert. Conservation agriculture is about protecting the soil, keeping your homeland fertile, so it will be able to provide food for this and coming generations. There is no need to own huge machines or great stretches of land. Allow your crops to produce their own fertilizer, save money and be independent from input dealers. Conservation agriculture is on the rise across the world. It is a real alternative with great commercial prospects. Be part of the change and put the three principles to practice. Number one, do you remember? Minimize soil disturbance. Number two, keep the soil covered. Number three, practice crop diversity.